Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International New York, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, DDG, Friedman LLP Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Herrick Feinstein LLP Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Corman Communities, a.k.a. Hotels, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, Sterling & Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. I don't understand, but in the dictionary, I don't believe they have a word, there's a tumla. I have a tumla today. <laughs> tumla. Uh, okay, uh, I have this individual, this Brooklyn-born tumla, who is a world-renowned comedian. Uh, and as they say, nobody wrote that I want to be a comedian when I grow up. But I'm so lucky to have my fellow friar, Stewie Stone, and talk about his life. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you. This is a tumla. This has uh, worked my whole life get on television, and I'm a tumula. Hey, what do you want? I, I could have said something worse. You know, I mean, we, we put <laughs> in the right thing. So let's talk a little bit about the, the family. Nobody knows about, you know, Bubba and Zeta, the grandma, grandpa. Tell me about them and your parents, okay? Uh, my, both grandparents come from Russia, but you never know, you ever notice you deal with the grandparents, they never know their birth. When were you born? It, it was in a snowstorm. When's your birthday? It was very hot. They don't have the day. Oh, so the, the my, date isn't there. The date isn't there. Both my grandparents, uh, sets of grandparents, came from Russia. White, they called it White Russia. And they settled in Brooklyn. And uh, my mother and father were born in the United States. Now, how did your mother meet your father? Oh, very interesting okay. story. Oh, my father, oh, I, a very interesting man. My father... Was with, it was a hoofer in vaudeville, tap dancer. B. Gates hoofer? B. Gates hoofer. He was a tap dancer. He did an act in vaudeville because my father had dreams. He didn't want to, you know, be a run-of-the-mill guy. My father was a good-looking, funny guy. And he w was a tap dancer in vaudeville. And then he had a friend that had a dance studio in Brooklyn. And my mother, who was previously married, brought in her daughter for tap lessons. And my father met my mother in the waiting room of a dancing studio. And when I was born, I was brought up in the back of a dancing studio. But we'll get to that later on. But you were born, and it was the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, would we call no, it? No, actually, I was brought in, in a, a manger. <laughs> a manger. I was brought in this manger. You know, yeah, People but... came. There was a star, and they brought gifts to my Flunkin, they brought Flunkin. It was a wonderful experience. And the major was Bethel Hospital, which subsequently became Brookdale. Right. Okay. So where, where How do you Brookdale? know the hospital? I don't know the hospital I was born in. What, what happened? I was born in the hospital because I wanted to be near my mother. Wait a second. That's I, was in the hospital. As opposed to the Russians and the grandparents who didn't know I did the research. You know, I give it's you like credit the, for that. You know, you know, it's like uh, Carl Reiner and the, you know, the 2,000 year old man. I'm the 2,000 year old interviewer. Okay, so you, you grew up in Brooklyn. Now, you were the only child? Yes. The only child? My mother was previously married, so I have a half-sister. Now, your father, you said before, he was a hoofer 
in vaudeville, and he he's but he was also a ruler in the printing company. Well, no, everybody had to have a job. You know, in the old days, you didn't uh, sit around and say, "I wonder what I'm going to do." You got out of school, you got a job, and you brought five dollars a week home to the house. My my uncle uh, had a printing factory, so naturally, my father got a job after school. He finished in a printing factory, and he was a ruler. Now, I, I never knew, my father said I was a ruler. I never knew what it was, but I found out in the old days when you had your bank books, you remember all the lines and the squares? He would set up the printing press that made the lines and was called a ruler. Now, you said, but your father was very fastidious and liked to keep himself very neat. No, he didn't want to get dirty. He the didn't want to get dirty. he found out you get dirty, that was it for being right, a so ruler. That was it. Okay. So you're growing up in Brooklyn. You went to Walt Whitman? That was my junior high. I went okay, to 181, uh, Walt Whitman Junior High, and Erasmus Hall High School. So the, everything was in, within the neighborhood. You Four block you, radius. You couldn't leave that neighborhood. I, have never, I never wanted to leave that neighborhood. What more did I need? There was a cleaner there. There was a great delicatessen, the Granada movie theater. And later in life, there was a pool room. Why leave the neighborhood? Wait, and later on, not far away, there was a Lomans. No, Lomans was on Bedford Avenue oh, okay. all the it was way too up. too far down, right, right. No, that was like, Lomans, that was like going to the Bronx. Right, okay, so you went to Erasmus Hall. Now, during high school, what kind of jobs did you have? I mean, no one says, what, what were you doing? You were a short kid, right? I was a short, short kid. Short, little intimidated kid? Yeah, and uh, I was always funny because I found out in life, humor will help you survive. If you make a guy laugh, he's not going to beat you up that, that readily. But I, when I was in Erasmus Hall High School, I must tell you, I don't know, like many of the kids, I w was afraid when I graduated, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea what I wanted to be, where I wanted to go. The only thing I, I knew in high school, my father, God love him, and this is a great lesson for parents. You don't have to have money to direct your kids. You have to have love and know your kid. My father came to me, I was 14 years old, he said, Stu, we have no money for college, you know that? I said, yeah, Dad. He said, but I think you have talent. You know, you tap dance and you have rhythm. I'm going to give you $5 a week. I said, what's $5 a week going to do for me, Dad? He said, I'm going to teach you something. You're going to take drum lessons. I said, yes. You learn to play the drums. You go to the Catskills every summer. You'll have a vacation, uh, which I liked because when I was uh, 15 years old, I worked in my uncle's jewelry factory. And it's a lot easier to play drums. Wait, 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 when you're working in the jewelry factory, was that the cufflinks? No, oh, no. they made ti tiaras. Oh, they made tiaras. <laughs> Custom jewelry, the big necklaces. And my mother worked in the office there. And every day at 5 o'clock, they would give me the jewelry to bring to the city, to the, the buyers. And they would package it up. And my mother would always pick it up to see if it wasn't too heavy for me. And if she, it was too heavy, worry, you'll get a rupture. And yeah. if it was too heavy, she would yell at my uncle, it's too heavy, take some of it out, they'll deliver it tomorrow. Wait, then he fired you, right? Oh, he fired me, yeah. He fired you. Now, but when, you, when you're when you going to, to high school, so you, 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 you're learning the drums. Right. Uh, and um, your first job in the Catskills uh, as a drummer right. was what, at Ulster? The Ulster Lake Hotel on Briggs Highway, $15 a week. $15 too much. They paid 50 you. but Did you get the, food? Yeah, but you weren't allowed to eat the meat. You only got chicken. That The owner would say, only chicken. Sunday, checkout day, it was steak day. Never get a steak. I try and bribe the uh, the head chef. So, so what do you do there at 15? You, you, you played the, the... I played drums. I chased girls. I sat by the pool. I, 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 a terrible room, you know, in back of the casino. What do you want? Everything? It, it, but you want to know something? You were getting out of out of uh, the neighborhood. People in the neighborhood said, Stewie's got a job playing drums. It went around the neighborhood. He's going to the Catskills. It was like I worked the Copacabana. So I was like a star that I went away and I played yeah. drums. Now, what was interesting that you also said, your father with the, uh, the, the dance studio, okay, you know, the Ginger Rogers, uh, Many people, Rita Hayworth and other things, tell me about the, these My people. father had a dance studio, and the, 
and he, he put, used to put shows on for the schools and everything, and they took tap lessons. And uh, guys loved my father, you know. Then the, later they would take ballroom lessons for their bar mitzvah and everything. And my father taught a lot of kids from Brooklyn. And Susan Haywood would call my father from Hollywood and say, every now and then, say, oh, hi, I remember the days I took the tap lessons. And he would get a call. I'll never forget this. I'm in the studio. And he gets a call. I said, who's that, Dad? He says, Ira Grossell. I said, who's Ira Grossell? He said, his, don't you remember his grandfather was the chazan, the cantor in the shul? Oh, he changed his name. I'm sorry. Jeff Chandler. Right. And Jeff loved my father because my father had the same hair, the gray hair on the side with the, the, the dark hair on top. Now, something that I have to tell, the story with the father and the Jacobs brothers. Oh. you got to tell that. Uh, my father was in a, they called it in show business a flash act. You're getting all these show business terms here. You deal with uh, brokers, they get one, uh, one language. You deal with uh, bankers, they'll give you interest. I'll talk about a flash act. You see, one profession I haven't ever done is an undertaker. Okay, they have a different type of... I got in trouble at the Concord. I did the undertaker's convention. I walked out on stage. I said, how do you want me to do this show, standing up or laying down? They got very annoyed at that. But anyway, so my father was in a flash act called the uh, Collegiates. This is many years ago, where they wore raccoon coats, and they did the Charleston. It was like 10 guys. And he was very friendly with the, the two brothers, Al and Jimmy, the Joachim brothers, who he started with. They would, they would go to dance halls and practice and share steps. You know, it was, a, it was an interesting thing. They come to my father, and they go, Ruby. My father changed his name. See, my father was born Ruben Sonnenberg. So he changed his name to Robert Stone so nobody would know he was Jewish. The fact he had a beard, yarmulke and titsis, had nothing to do with it. He passed for 12 years. Anyway, my father went, Ruby, we're going to leave the act and we're going to steal the costumes because my brother is graduating high school and he's funny and he's going to come in the act and we're going to have a terrific act. And they left the act. And they changed their name, and they became the Ritz Brothers. The Jackham Brothers, the Joachim Brothers, became the Ritz Brothers. It was Harry Ritz that came out of high school. Let's now go. You graduate high school. You graduate uh, Erasmus. Right. And you're still working in the summers up at the, uh, the Catskills. Catskills. And working as a drummer. As a drummer. As a drummer. On weekends. Okay, on, on I played week for Maya Davis, <coughs> Stephen Scott, Lester Lannan. I did all the bar So you were on the circuit as one was. That say. was it. Up until I was 30, I thought all swans were made out of chopped liver. I never knew anything. Now, um, what about the. Uh, so what did you do at Brooklyn College for three years? I had a sun reflector. Do you remember the sun reflector? You see, it's like Arnold Pennell when I did his life story. I said, how come you left City College after two years? He says, I couldn't find the parking spot anymore. That's what, what I would do. I'd go to Brooklyn College. I never graduated, but I went to Brooklyn College. And at Boylan Hall, all the guys would sit out, and they had a sun reflector. Remember, with aluminum, and you'd sit did there. You, did you have the oil, a, too? Did you oh, have the, oh, sure. Yeah, sure. You yeah. bake, and you go, this, that's what I did. And I went to class. And I, I, I uh, was in a writing class, and I'll never forget, I wrote, uh, they said, write a story about uh, you know, what you do. So I wrote a story about going to the musicians' union to try and get a job. And I said, and I was with this midget, was carrying this beast, big bass fiddle. So I said to him, do you uh, play the bass? He says, no, I live in it. So I wrote that joke, and the professor said, you are not going to be a writer. This is not what I want to hear. So I knew there was a lot of pressure. So how do you get from Brooklyn College to get a job at the famous Concord Hotel? First, you take the short line bus. And you pass the motel on the, the motel mountain? Motel on the mountain. mountain. No, I, w I was playing drums in a band, and I had a friend that was the band leader, uh, Les Wagman, and Les... Uh, Said, said, we have a terrific deal. We're going to play in the Concord Monday through Thursday. In the back room, probably. In the, the back room. I mean, in the Cordillon room. It's called the Cordillon room. I said, great. And I went there, and I loved it. And I would drive home weekends and do the uh, biggest show, the bar mitzvahs and everything. And then I saw the guys on the social staff. They would get up and entertain. And I was fairly funny. And one of the sweetest men that ever lived was Lee Berman, who at that time was the social director. 
And he says, why don't you join the, uh, get on the social staff? But you have to have a personality for you. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know, but. I did, you know what I would do? He says, you'll start by doing guided tours. I said, what's that going to do for me? He says, you'll learn to talk in front of people. You'll make up jokes. I would do a guided tour. I'd meet them in the lobby, and I would say, uh, they would say, uh, how many uh, eggs do you people use a day here at the Concord Hotel? I said, we use three, but we have uh, three eggs a day. How do you do that? Well, we have this busy chicken. He runs around. We can't find him. How many pounds of meat? So, and, so you're doing a little ad-libbing. Uh, I'm learning to do ad-libs. And then Lee said, you could do Simon Says for me. And I would practice doing Simon Says. But the big thing we did, which I loved, we had a, a social staff of all performers, not athletes. Grossinger's had basketball players, football players. The Concord had little guys, a guitar player, a singer. And if it rained, we did a show in the Night Owl Lounge. Right, and that, but that was good. You, you prayed for rain. I prayed for rain. Because Every, you got paid more, right? No, you didn't get paid more, but you got a chance to be what you wanted to be, a comedian. And if you're on stage and you're getting laughs, you got more girls. Wait, wait here's the question. I, I think it was written that you, somebody quoted you once. Nobody says, I want to be a comedian. I want to, especially when you're Jewish, you were born to be a physician, you were born to be an accountant. A comedian? How, really, all kibitzing aside. How? Okay. I tell this to the young people that ask me. I wanted success. I wanted to make a living. I wanted to do well. I wanted to get out of Brooklyn. Uh, I happen to be dyslexic, so studying was very difficult for me. When you and I were growing up, we never knew the term dyslexic. No, I, okay. he was a bad reader. Right. He was a bad, a bad reader. reader. Slow, slow. Slow, slow reader. And uh, what talent did I have? I... I, I, I exam. I was a pretty good drummer, but I say, what are you going to get? Forty-two dollars a night, eight dollars an hour overtime. If you got the extra, that's when you. But you got the knishes. I didn't bring anything okay. home. I never brought the okay. stuff home. But anyway, where am I going from here? So I would see the comics on stage, and I'd see Jan Murray and uh, Jack Carter and all the the great comedians, Shecky Green. They came out in the tuxedo and 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 they drove up in a Cadillac. I said, this can't be that hard, but it's the most difficult thing in the world to be a comedian. But you know, we were, when you and I got together, we were talking about being a comedian then and being a comedian today. Because something, maybe I'm fast forwarding, which I'll get to, is they were not, when, when you broke into this, because as you said, you were, the Simon Says, okay, right. and then you, then, then fortunately, uh, you, you know, you go on later on and, why don't you tell the story with the, how you get to the next level? Okay. Uh, I was doing, uh, I do the Simon Says at the Concord, and I did funny bathing beauty contests where you'd spritz and like a Rickles kind of bathing beauty contest. And uh, I was fairly funny, you know. I, 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 if you read Marjorie Morningstar, I was like the Noel Ammon of, of, of that thing. And I did the contest, and the guy walks up to me. He says, you're pretty funny. I said, yeah. He says, could you talk on stage for 20 minutes? I said, yeah. I a, How much will you pay me? He said, I'll give you $500 a week. $500? $500 a week. You were making what? The... No, I was making a $150 a week at the Concord. I said, how much time? He said, 20 minutes. I said, for $500, i will do 40 minutes. And he was a buyer for the Playboy Club. What do you mean he was the buyer? He would... Book all the. Oh, he was the, the booking. Buyer. He was, he the, was the buyer. Uh, you call him up and uh, you start off with. with Wait a second. Weeks. How, you didn't even know what a Playboy Club was. Oh, I knew the Playboy Club in New York. Right. But I knew that it, it was exciting. But he, the first job he gave me was uh, four days at the Boston Playboy Club, and they would review you. You do three shows a night, and the room director would give you an A, a B, or a C. And if you got good reviews, they book you. So I started to do well. I developed my act, and I was doing 40 weeks a year of Playboy. Now, you said to and you did that for a number of years, right? A number of years. But you were also saying to me that to get into the, the, the comedy business at that time, it was something that you had to do. You had to work like the strip clubs, right? And these small joints, as we would say. And then the South was one good start, oh, right? But, but I, first of all, any comic asked me, what do you, how do you become a comedian? And it's very simple. You do it. You just do it. And the sad thing about comedy is you got to be bad before you're ever decent. And you got to work a long time before you're good and a longer time before you're great. 
It's a learning experience. They have to bad, you have to be bad. So I was working in the Concord and they didn't have comedy clubs in those days. And I would see the agent and I, you'd work a strip club. You'd go to Connecticut or drive to Albany and they had a club with it. Had a, a singer, a dancer, and the stripper was the headline of the club. And the comic was the, the MC. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a nice round of applause for the star of our show, Miss Julie Angel Eyes Taylor. They all had billing, Angel Eyes, uh, Jeanette the Body, whatever it was. And you got $55 for the show. And the stripper would give you $5 for driving her up. So you didn't have to be that good. You had to have a car. I learned that early in comedy. In the Catskills, the, the first thing the Charlie Rapp Agency asked you, you got a car? You got a car, you got a job. And that's, I would work the strip joints. I worked the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Concord. And what about, what about Alabama? You told me the story about oh, Alabama. Oh, Alabama. Well, my first job, it, it, I'm working Bachelor's Three with a singer. Now, Bachelor's Three was in, in Fort, Fort Lauderdale. Lauderdale for Joe Namath. And I worked with the singer, and the singer was at the low ebb of his career. It was a long time ago. And he said, I'd like to take you on the road with me. And I said, well, where are you going? You're finished. I'm, 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 I don't want to work with you. I'm looking for Sammy Davis to take me on the road with him. Well, he, he plays a song. He says, this song will bring me back. It's a great song. I played a song. The song was My Eyes Adored You. It was the number one song in the country. It was my buddy Frankie Valley. So now Frankie says, I'm taking you on the road. But the first job you're going to do is Dolphin, Alabama. Now imagine the fear in a kid from Brooklyn, by Dolphin, Alabama. Wait, and the kid from Jersey? Frankie. Well, he was a star. He could, he'd get away with his songs. But I walk out on stage, I say, good evening, and the first thing I hear is a rebel yell, yeah, a Yankee, you know, because my accent. So I looked at that audience, and I said, the first thing you have to do is not be afraid. And I said, let me tell you something, folks. My life is on the line on this job. I'm going to be out here. You ain't scaring me off the stage. And that was now, it. Now, that comes after the Playboy Club? A yes, after okay. the Playboy Club. You're on the Playboy Club for three years? Yes. On the circuit. Mm -hmm. How do you get to Bachelors 3? I, I started to work. Uh, uh, they started to know me. And I, I got an agency. I was, I was with the William Morris Agency. And... Uh, there was a club in Pittsburgh called the Holiday House in Pittsburgh, Monroeville. And that was a great club because every big star went there to break in their act. Because it was like hidden. You were in Pittsburgh before you went to Vegas, before you did anything. I worked with Frankie Avalon. And uh, Frankie Avalon says, you're funny. I'm going to Bachelors 3 to work for Joe Namath. You want to come down? Now, Joe Namath owned this club? Bachelors 3. Bobby Van and Ray Abruzzi. Those are the three bachelors. Uh, Namath was the quarterback of the right, Jets. Jets. Ray Abruzzi was a free safety for the Jets. And Bobby was the businessman that owned all, all the restaurants and everything. And Frankie Avalon takes me down there. They see me and they say, I want you to work with this guy. And they put me with Frankie Valley. And that was the beginning. Now, at this time, Frankie's career, you felt, was, was dwindling? Very dwindling. Very dwindling. Uh, Frankie's an amazing guy. He's probably my closest friend. godfather to my daughter. I'm godfather to his sons. But I always say Jesus came back from the dead once. Frankie's done it four times. I've been through four career comebacks with him. It's an amazing thing. Right. You have been with Frankie Valley as the opener for... Many years, I, but I've worked with every major star. I, I was with Steve and Edie. I was with Sonny and Cher. I was with Paul Anka. I was with the Village People. Right, but Shirley one Pazzi. of the things that you also said to me that you really wanted to do was get to Vegas. My dream when I thought of being a comedian was to open for Frank Sinatra. I, I, I didn't dream of being Jay Leno. I didn't dream of being a star. I wanted to be Pat Hen I wanted to open for Frank Sinatra. I wanted to wear the tuxedo with the tie, do the show, run out to the crap table, shoot crap. My life was always about having a good time. So when did you finally arrive in Vegas? Interesting story. I, I'm working uh, the Copacabana with Gladys Knight and the Pips. The famous Copacabana. I get a call from Lee Solomon, who was the head of William Morris, and he said, 
if I can get you out of the last day of the COPA date, you could open at the Fremont, which was downtown Las Vegas, the Fremont Hotel with Pat Boone. And I'm all excited, Pat Boone, Pat Boone. And two days later, he calls me, he says, Mr. Padel will not let you out of the Copa Cabana. I go, oh, gee, my life is over. Three days later, he said, you're going to work the Copa Cabana, you're going to work uh, Las Vegas with Brenda Lee. Remember Brenda? I'm sorry. So anyway, that was my first time in Vegas, four weeks, two shows a night, seven nights a week. And how many, so how many years ago do you think Vegas was? Vegas was... 30, 30 uh, years ago? 25 years ago? 40 years 40 ago. 40 years ago. I landed in Vegas. They didn't have a, uh, they didn't have a terminal. They hand you the pl the, your luggage and you wait walk Wait a second. Up. I thought it was literally Vegas was when they had the cavemen walking over there. Oh, it was, I'm, tell I'm telling you, it was like interesting. And the, the, the strip wasn't the in thing. I mean, the furthest place was the Riviera. I mean, after that came Caesar's Palace and built the, no, it was great. And they were so nice to me because they knew I was a kid and it was my first time. So I was making $1,000 a week. So yeah. I said, I want to get paid. And they said, you can't get paid because you waste the money. So what they did, closing night, the bosses came in with the cops with the guns and they put down 4,000 silver dollars bags in my dressing room. How are you gonna pick that up and get it on the plane as a joke? That's great. Now, with two minutes left, if I didn't say how you met your wife, you met Fran, how? I met my wife at the Concord Hotel, walking out of the dining room. I took one look, she was everything I ever wanted. She was beautiful, educated, very wealthy family. They brought me home to meet her mother, she says, Mom, this is my dream man, Stewie Stone, social director of the Concord. And after we got her mother's head out of the oven, it worked <laughs> out pretty good. Right. And you have a daughter? I have a gorgeous daughter, uh, Savannah. She's 15 years old. She's, she's beautiful. And she's an equestrian. She rides horses like I did. Oh. I said, oh. Wait, we, Prospect Park, we had horses. No, right? I would get up in the morning and say, Dad, I'm going to the stables. <laughs> No. Who had horses? What are you talking? <laughs> the horse pulled the ice truck. What are you talking with horses? Okay, now, you know, even today, besides the time we that we spend time at the Friars, you know, at the lounge chairs outside of the gym over there, you know, to to catch a snooze over there, you're still performing. Yes. In a I couple of weeks, you're going down to Florida, right? A couple of weeks, I'll do be in Florida for three weeks. I'll be at the, uh, I'll be at the Westbury Music Fair with Frankie Valley in April. Uh, I'll be back at the Bagata again, and I'm and, and then you go to Newark. You I'm go to New Jersey. Freddie Roman and I. Freddie Roman and you, and on May the second or something like May that. May the second, and I have my own yeah. show. I just sold to Queensboro Community College, Early Bird Comedy, and the ad is Early Bird. You get a discount for Early. No, no, Early Bird Comedy, and you have to be over fifty-five to get in to see the show. We card them at the door because our audience is mature. And we want to know it's, it's comedy for mature. It's not what these kids are doing with the cursing and yelling. It's just. And that's the difference today, as you were saying to me. Comedy has changed over the years, right? The difference is when we started out, you had to be good. You, you got a report. You didn't do good. You didn't work again. So technically, I would talk to Alan King about it. We were waiters. We carried the jokes out on the tray, did the act. They didn't like one joke. We took it off the tray. These kids do it for themselves now. Okay. They don't care about the audience. I am so lucky to have my fellow friar and my friend Stewie Stone, and I'm happy that I was able to talk about your life. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, my friend.